Good morning and welcome back to the second day of the Serena Networking Conference 2009. I hope you're all suitably barbecued this morning. Uh, one, one person has already said to me, I smell of charcoal. I said, don't worry about it, everybody smells of charcoal. Um, I hope you all enjoyed last night as much as I did. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful setting and uh, really good entertainment. So, this morning we have two talks. My only input into this has been the title. There is no intention that one of the speakers is talking about bad clouds and one is talking about good clouds. So don't look for the bad person and the good person. Uh, they're both talking about different applications of clouds and how electronic digital clouds might be used to address some of the nastier environmental clouds uh, that are on our horizons. So, first speaker this morning is Bill Santano from Canary in Canada. Thanks, Terrence. Buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, a little bit different approach to why clouds I think are important going forward, and that's to address uh, one of the biggest challenges we face on this uh, planet, and that's, of course, uh, climate change, and the important role that we play in the research and education network community with NRENs and universities in how can we address that problem uh, through clouds and virtualization and so forth. Uh, of course, you all, if you read newspapers or following the blogs and so forth, are familiar with the challenges of climate change. What's most interesting, of course, is uh, the new uh, Obama administration in the United States has appointed a very strong team of advisors in his cabinet to uh, really help him address this problem. Uh, John Holdren, who's his national science advisor, of course, has been a big proponent of uh, addressing the challenge of climate change. And if you have a chance, I really recommend you take a look at this YouTube video here. It really succinctly puts it into a very five-minute short video, the challenge we face, and, uh, and uh, really corrects some of the misrepresentations put out there by some of the deniers and so forth. The other good one is Stephen Chu, who's head of the Department of Energy uh, in the United States. Uh, uh, he's got a thing out there called Wake Up America, and he's been talking about this as well. And, of course, he just launched the ARPA-E program in the United States, which is a major initiative to look at how uh, we change the energy mix in the United States. Uh, you know, ARPA, of course, was the uh, progenitor for the uh, Internet itself, and so hopefully the same uh, result will come out of the ARPA E program. What's more interesting, the United States uh, Geological Survey and the National Academies of Science have recently both come out two reports indicating, uh, talking about tipping points, that in fact climate change is not going to be a gradual, smooth increase in temperature. Uh, where things get just, you know, nicer springs and warmer summers, we're going to go through some major climatic disruptions. In fact, John Holdren says that, uh, it's a misnomer to call this climate change or global warming. He says this is global climatic disruption, is what we're talking about. And so, uh, what the concern is, is that there's ten major tipping points that are about to occur within the next decade or so, and this will really have a major effect on, of course, our governments and the public, and there'll be a huge outcry to do something about climate change. Uh, things like the major drought in the southwest, uh, of course, in, in Canada, the Arctic ice is rapidly disappearing and, and at a much faster rate than any forecast. And there's other ones like the big uh, conveyor current in the Atlantic, uh, the western Antarctic ice shelf, and so on and so forth. One of the more interesting studies is a report came out by MIT, this was in Nature about two weeks ago, that reanalyzed all the climate models that have been done by various scientists around the world and came to the conclusion that they were far too conservative in some of their own functions and their confidence intervals. And their conclusion, in fact, is, is that global climate is going to warm up by about 5.1 degrees centigrade by 2095. Um, and this is very significant because if you think about it, most of Europe and most of Canada, uh, in the last global ice age, the average temperature was 6 degrees colder than it is today. And in 100 years, we're going to go almost 6 degrees in the opposite direction. So if you put that in context, you realize that this is going to have a really profound implication if we don't do something about climate change. Uh, at the recent uh, Bill Clinton-George Bush summit in uh, Toronto uh, last week, in fact, Bill Clinton talked about this study as well. And he, you know, decried that the press has not picked up on this. This is significantly worse than any other previous model or analysis we've seen out there, and the data is far, far more accurate. And yet, even the data coming in from Mauna Loa and, and the amount of carbon we're emitting in the atmosphere continues to increase, and despite this recession, it's accelerating. The amount of methane going in the atmosphere has already taken off for some reason, we don't know why, and so expecting that even this model may be too conservative as well. These are various climate forecast models. 
Uh, there's been done by the International Panel on Climate Change. There's various models done by various research groups around the world. The dotted line shows the MIT study and also shows the confidence intervals. Of course, no scientist can actually give you exact temperature forecast. So we have the various 90% uh, confidence intervals, and we see where the MIT takes us at 5.2 degrees. If we go up to the 90% point, it's going to be 11 degrees uh, globally. And in places like Canada, it's going to be a nominal median temperature of 11 degrees because of something called polar amplification. So these are the huge changes in temperature in the next uh, 20, 30, 50 years. Um, this is another present, uh, paper done by Ramathon and Yang at the Scripps Institute, just showing what these uh, big tipping points will be about based on the original IPCC estimate that we're only going to have about a 2.4 degree temperature increase. This is before the MIT study, where actually that whole curve has to move over about 3 degrees to the right. But even based on the old data, we can see that at the 90% confidence interval, all these serious tipping points will occur. The West Antarctic ice sheet is the most serious. This is a, um, the West Antarctic ice actually sits on land below sea level. It's a bunch of submerged islands. And, and what the concern is of all these glaciers you're seeing calving off the Antarctic coast uh, will allow seawater to get under the ice sheet, and this could break up very, very quickly. And that will raise sea levels by uh, 10 to 30 meters around the world. So it's, uh, we're already at the realized warm where, uh, where that red line is, and it's things are expected to rapidly increase in the next two decades. And uh, uh, NOAA in the United States is forecast this summer to be another record-breaking average uh, uh, warming this year as well. So it's, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to be Cassandra, but things are getting pretty serious. Our challenge is that, uh, according to the treaties, uh, this is in Canada, Canada and Australia, the two world's two worst emitters of CO2 on a per capita basis. Here in Europe, you're a little bit faster, about uh, 15 to 20 tons per CO2. But whatever your number is, in, by the Kyoto Agreement, and now the upcoming Copenhagen Agreement this year, uh, we have to get down to at least two tons per person. That's the projection made by the Stern Report in the United Kingdom if, if we're going to have any chance of stabilizing the rate of growth of CO2 emissions. We can't stop it. We can't level it off. We can't even reverse it. All we want to do is slow it down. We were beyond the point of trying to stop CO2. Many people think CO2 is like acid rain, that once we stop the emissions, the planet will return to normal temperatures. The fact is CO2 saves the atmosphere for thousands of years. And it, it, the planet is going to warm up. There's nothing we can do about that. All we want to do is slow down the rate of warming so that we can find ways to adjust our society, adapt uh, to this whole new uh, planetary ecosystem. But to do that, just to slow down, not to stop, to slow down, we have to get down to at least two tons, and by our current study, down to one ton per person. That means dramatic changes to our society and our economy. Small incremental changes you know, driving a car less or taking a bus is not going to be enough. We're, this is going to require radical changes in everything we do. And it's going to affect research networking, it's going to affect university academic research, every aspect of our society. And this is an immense challenge. It's really daunting how we're going to ever hope to achieve that. So one of the courses, uh, big discoveries in the last couple of years was the contribution that the internet or the uh, information communication technology has uh, to CO2 contributions which is estimated between 2 to 3% of all CO2 emissions. And this is through the consumption of electricity, which is generally produced by coal-fired plants around the world. Uh, and so it's not a lot, but the concern is that the Internet is really, and the Internet ICT in general, is doubling so quickly. In fact, a new study came out of Paris, out of the uh, Association of uh, Energy Producers, indicates that in many homes now, the biggest power consumption is all electronic goods, rather than the traditional refrigerator and stove and so forth. So it really shows the growth from our industry in this contribution. And already ICT represents between 8 to 9% of electricity consumption, and this is really climbing quite significantly. Future broadband alone, just the routers of the future broadband, where everybody's getting 100 megabits of the home, is going to consume about 5% of all electricity. And in Australia, they have to make them have to build six new coal plants just to handle this type of new broadband infrastructure that's being planned uh, in Australia. So it's a major challenge. And universities are one of the biggest culprits, as it turns out. Uh, Educause, the United States, has been doing some studies in this regard. But the typical big research university in the United States, where most of the power comes from coal, as here in the UK, excluding France, or here in Europe, I should say, excluding France, a uh, university produces between 200 to 500,000 metric tons of CO2, of which 300,000 tons 
comes from the data center networking. So when a university president wakes up and says, okay, I got some new regulations, I have to be carbon neutral and so forth, they start looking around, who's the biggest culprit in campus? They quickly find out it's you guys. And then they re- now they say, okay, now we've got to make some changes here. When cap and trade comes, or carbon taxes, or mandated carbon neutrality, it's the IT people who have to come up with solutions. We collectively are going to find a way to address this major problem. So it's somewhere between the United States, universities contribute between 5 to 10 percent of all CO2 emissions in the United States. Under the proposed cap and trade in the United States, almost every university that produces over 25,000 tons of CO2, which will be the new standard in the Copenhagen Agreement, hopefully, uh, will have to be regulated and be under a cap and trade system. So it's not the big power plants, not the steel smelters that are all the culprits. We are just as bad as well. And we'll be subject to the same rules and regulations in terms of direct emissions. Now, why is this important? Because uh, uh, already we're seeing in the United Kingdom and other countries, RFPs and funding councils demanding what's called shadow cost carbon accounting. Provinces of Canada and also in the United States, California is looking at this, uh, where you must include the cost of carbon in your research proposal, in your annual activity, or in response to RFPs. Uh, the United Kingdom, the funding councils have announced that they are linked funding to universities and research to your carbon costs. All, all government car- RFPs now must include shallow cost carbon in the UK, and, and, and now that's coming in Canada as well, and EU nations and other countries are expected to follow. So everything you do, you will now have to account for your carbon. When you issue an RFP or when you buy equipment and so forth, it's something you've got to understand very carefully. But for the business world, there is a major opportunity, and there's also a major opportunity for research networks and universities. Um, there's a great uh, website called uh, uh, Carbon Point, or Point Carbon, I should say, which follows this stuff. It's estimated because of cap and trade, emissions trading, and so forth, there can be a $500 billion market in the trading of carbon offsets. Uh, and this is expected to grow quite dramatically. Last year was a $92 billion market. Now, well, how this happens is from cap and trade and from voluntary carbon trading, and uh, where if utilities outside of Europe, where they gave away the permits for free, have to buy emission permits or have to buy offsets. Most of that money has gone into planting trees or reducing methane from garbage dumps and so forth, but there's no reason why the ICT industry cannot be similarly eligible uh, for this money if you can show that you've reduced your carbon output at your campus or on your research and education network. It's a phenomenal amount of money, particularly uh, with new Obama's uh, or the, uh, cap and trade bill called the Waxman Markey bill, which is passed going through the U.S. Congress right now. And that will require every emitter who buys emission permits, which will include universities, to also spend for every dollar in emission permit a dollar twenty-five on carbon offset. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars here. And so if you prepare yourself and plan to get ready for this, you can be eligible to earn these carbon offsets. If you can demonstrate through a very rigorous process that your application or service, if you move to clouds, get rid of your physical computers and so forth, you can be eligible to earn these carbon offsets. And you can also earn emission permits as well, but it's a more complicated process. Um, so there is, uh, I was just talking to Mike Norris here from uh, HeNet, um, I hope you don't mind mentioning this, Mike, but uh, uh, he's putting on a, a course uh, uh, on for universities and so forth on how to go through the standards, what's called ISO 14064, to quantify and measure how you can reduce your CO2 uh, through the use of networks, clouds, and virtualization. Now, one thing I hear a lot from equipment vendors and uh, businesses around the world is say energy efficiency. Uh, we will sell you a product that's 10% more efficient or 15% more efficient than the previous product. This will help solve your energy problems and your CO2 problems. The issue is we don't have an energy consumption problem. The problem facing this planet is CO2 emissions. We have lots of energy. We have some coal and all sorts of sources, and that's not the issue. What we want to do is change the energy mix away from energy that produces CO2 to energy that has a very small carbon footprint. And so energy efficiency is actually a very uh, it's misleading. And this is something called the Jevons paradox or the Kazoom Brooks paradox. In fact, Jevons was an economist about, uh, born about 50 years after James Watt invented the steam engine. And he discovered that if they made the steam engine more efficient, that it had many more applications in different industries. And in fact, the demand for coal went up as they increased the efficiency of the steam engine. Well, this uh, discovery was forgotten about until the last energy crisis we had in 1973. 
two economists, Kazum Books, looked at that and looked at the U.S. Congress passed what were called the CAFE laws and said, okay, uh, at that time, uh, this is the first time the minimum efficiency uh, of mileage on cars was introduced, home installation and appliances and so forth. The U.S. Congress said, great, now we've got these energy efficiency laws, we'll be able to wean ourselves off foreign, foreign oil and we'll be much better off. Well, 30 years later, we discovered that in fact it's just the exact ha- opposite happened. And the economists realized that because what energy efficiency does is reduces the cost of a product or service. And the natural consumer response, therefore, is to buy more of that product or service. So increasing the efficiency of cars allows consumers to drive further or buy bigger cars. Home efficiency or heating efficiency in homes allow them to buy bigger homes, bigger appliances, and so forth. So efficiency paradoxically increases energy consumption. So you want to have, it's, energy efficiency is important, but only after you address the problem of CO2, either through a cap and trade and carbon taxes and so forth. It's part of a solution, but it's not a right policy direction. So be very careful of any approaches to energy efficiency if you first haven't addressed the problem of how you reduce CO2. So we believe that really it's not the consumption of energy that's a problem, it's the energy mix. If you can get your energy from a source that does not produce carbon, then regardless of how much energy you use, it doesn't matter. Because if it's a zero carbon strategy, like if the energy comes from renewable sources, then you use as much energy as you want and not be emitting the CO2, which is the real problem. And so, the, so what we have to think about is approaches in our network architectures, our computing solutions, which are zero carbon. Now, wind and solar are the most likely candidates for zero carbon strategy. There'll be some hydroelectricity in places like Canada and Norway, but most places around the world is the wind and solar. I'm not ruling out nuclear power, but the big challenge we have with nuclear power is there's not going to be another nuclear plant built in North America or perhaps elsewhere in, North, in Europe for another decade. It's just the opportunity cost of building a nuclear power plant is so huge, and we just don't have that luxury of time to wait until we have a sufficient amount of nuclear power. We've seen that plant being built in Finland, the cost of skyrocketing, the venture capital company, or investors and so forth are very leery of nuclear power because of huge costs as well. Now the big problem with when you use renewable power like windmills and solar panels or hydroelectricity is most of the good sites, particularly for wind, are not near our cities or our universities. The remote distant locations, and so we somehow we have to get that power uh, either from our cities to our universities uh, through our transmission lines and so forth. Now that's very expensive. Transmission lines have uh, losses of up to 15%, and most of the transmission line infrastructure is totally inadequate to support this type of uh, uh, big surge in renewable energy. The trans- current transmission line infrastructure was built in the old days of very central managed gas plant type uh, approaches where you have a big power plant near a city and the transmission lines were built out to the uh, rural areas and small towns and so forth. What we want to do is reverse that and build transmission line capacity from these remote sites and so forth. And that's going to take decades. <coughs> so we believe there's another approach, and that is to actually move our computing data centers to where the energy is. And this is, we have one big advantage in our industry, in the ICT industry, is that we can move computers and networks and so forth if we have high-speed optical research networks to access these data centers at the remote sites. And so this is a big advantage of using cloud for virtualization. We can use these data centers, build them where the energy is plentiful and cheap, uh, and use renewable energy, and then access these uh, facilities through high-speed optical networks like we have in the research and education community. And so this is why we think the NRENs, uh, in general, are going to have a very critical role going forward and working with the universities to help find solutions like this of building cloud services, virtualization, where the infrastructure is located at renewable energy sites, disconnected from the grid. Now, I emphasize that why you want to be disconnected off the electrical grid as opposed to the computational grid is because the price of power is going to jump dramatically. Uh, once they start auctioning the permits here in Europe, which I think is supposed to start this year, and once cap and trade comes in North America, the price of even clean power is going to triple. Now, although the cap and trade affects dirty power, what the implications are is that industries and businesses are going to quickly move to renewable power as well. So in cities, there's going to be huge demand for clean renewable power, and economists expect the price of renewable power is to be much higher than even dirty power. 
the beauty of our industry is, therefore, we don't have to compete with that same power in the cities if we can use our high-speed optical networks to relocate our equipment directly where the energy sites are. And in fact, many universities have uh, campuses or uh, remote research labs or land-grant universities in the United States where we can build these facilities and connect them with the high-speed optical networks. And if you have your own source of electrical power disconnected from the grid, then you have your own guaranteed price of power. Uh, you're not locked into what the utility will sell you because of a huge demand for renewable power. So it's very important you get your own independent sources of power for your clouds, grids, and data infrastructure. We already have many examples of this. I apologize, we're trying to figure out this is Windows Vista. All of a sudden, stop playing pictures in the middle of my slide. But here's some examples of what this is already happening. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, they've already figured this out. This is part of their basic core business strategy. In fact, Google said, power is going to be, give us the competitive advantage. Google has, for example, has built uh, or purchased an old aluminum smelter on the Columbia River, which is supposed to be on the upper right-hand picture, uh, so they have their own power source uh, for the huge data center in Washington State. And that this is part of their corporate strategy as well for uh, Amazon and Microsoft and so forth. They all know that power is going to be very critical uh, in, to be a competitive player going forward. Uh, but we have other examples in the, UK, in the United States. We have ATO, which is building uh, solar-powered and wind-powered data centers. Iceland, of course, has a national strategy in that regard. Interesting company in the UK called Ecotricity. They will build a big windmill at their data center out in the country, for example, at no cost. They will undertake all the capital costs if you agree to sign a 10-year contract to purchase the power from that windmill at about $0.04 cents per kilowatt hour. So there's already companies thinking about this and businesses in terms of their data centers. And in Canada, we already have several companies building uh, uh, data centers that are powered solely by windmills or tidal power and so forth. Uh, there's projects in Scotland, Ireland, <coughs> and Norway as well in this direction. So this is not new. Uh, and looking at this, a lot of people are becoming aware of that. But I really think universities and researchers should think about this very quickly because the costs are going to jump uh, rapidly in the next coming years. Another interesting project is nice and nice beautiful picture here. Uh, uh, Bill Gates drives me nuts sometimes. Um, uh, is uh, the Nordic countries, which the project they're looking at, is to uh, relocate their high-performance computing facilities to Iceland. So this is a proposal that's under development now, and uh, uh, what the Nordic funding councils have told researchers that uh, if you want to buy a cluster, you have to include the cost of carbon and the cost of energy in that cluster if you locate it in your home uh, university. But if you move that cluster to uh, Iceland, you can get a much bigger facility, uh, have more compute power for your research and so forth. And, of course, Nordinet, the Nordic countries can do that because Nordinet, of course, has this very high capacity research network linking Iceland back uh, to the rest of the Nordic countries. So this is a, they are very advanced in their thinking. This is the type of uh, approaches we need in terms of future uh, uh, computation, grids, clouds, and so forth. You need high-speed research networks. NRENs are going to be absolutely fundamentally essentially essential to this type of strategy and clouds and virtualization are the other component of this. So all this work we're doing with clouds and grids, the computational grids and so forth, are all coming together in terms of this uh, uh, approach to solving the problem of CO2 emissions. In Canada, of course, we have a number of projects, as I mentioned, across the country. We are blessed with lots of uh, renewable energy sites. Uh, many of our businesses who are setting up these facilities, of course, are trying to target the U.S. market. Uh, where cap and trade will drive up the price of electricity. So a lot of data center companies are looking to move to Canada, and this is a, a major strategy amongst our utilities and so forth. Um, uh, but the big challenge we face, of course, as we build all these data centers, is that there can be a lot more traffic on our network, huge traffic volume, because we want to make, reduce the latency. Uh, we want to make sure that the performance is as much as possible the same as having the compute cluster on your campus. So in our future networks, to, to meet these needs of the data centers, we want to make sure we're not transferring the problem of all this energy consumption CO2 from the data center to the network. So it's very important that we design our future networks that are also as much as possible zero carbon. And this is a big challenge. Optical networks, it's not too bad. Optical networks uh, don't grow linearly with traffic consumption, and we can produce a very low energy networks uh, using uh, the latest 100 gig and soon maybe 1,000 gig waves. It's electronic equipment like routers and aggregation devices, which are really major consumers of power. And as I mentioned, that Australian study that indicates that the next generation of routers 
are going to consume 5% of our electrical power alone. So that's clearly an unsustainable, unsustainable path. We have to find new architectures that get us away from that huge energy consumption and course CO2 emissions. So as, in part of that objective, Canary just announced last week a uh, green IT pilot program, a $3 million program uh, to invite uh, researchers and next re research and education networks to look at possible solutions where we can build a zero carbon NREN. And it's to look at architectures in terms of reliability and restorability where every node, every router node, every optical node is powered by a renewable source like a windmill or solar panel and so forth. Now the challenge of that, of course, is the wind dies and we know the sun sets, and is how do you make a network reliable if the router is going up and down or the optical switches are going down depending on the availability of power. So we believe that through internet protocols, by having multiple paths, um, that using these protocols we can reroute traffic very quickly uh, based on the availability of wind and solar power and so forth. And so that's what we want to demonstrate with this pilot, that we can do this. We've already had a couple of experiments. And the second part of the pilot is to show how we can capture the revenue from carbon offsets. By building a zero carbon network, of course, we've reduced the CO2 emissions from a traditional network, and we want to go through what's called the ISO 14064 process of demonstrating that we actually reduce CO2 emissions in every aspect of this, and therefore, we can claim dollars for it. As the price of carbon increases, right now it's trading between 5 to $20, up to $100, uh, where it should be according to the CERN report, uh, this is going to be a significant amount of revenue uh, for our research and education networks and for our universities as well. And so we want to show the whole business case, uh, we'll make all this in the public domain, of how you quantify, measure uh, the uh, actual carbon offsets, how you do a baseline emission measurement, then how you aggregate and broker these offsets, take them into the trade market, and actually earn revenue this way. And so we think this will be a significant source of revenue for our universities and NRENs uh, going forward. So this uh, program, by the way, uh, as already, we have several European uh, colleagues who are interested in participating. It's, it's open to our European colleagues and American. Uh, so please talk to me afterwards, and I'll gladly uh, uh, make you the proper connections for you. But we re really truly want to make this an international initiative. Uh, there's going to be a couple other major announcements in Canada and elsewhere in this area as well. Uh, so it's going to be significantly a lot more money than uh, $3 million in the next uh, couple of months. And so the big issue, of course, is, as I mentioned, is how you make... A, a, a network or a data center reliable uh, when you're powered solely by windmills and solar panels. And uh, so we need new network architectures and business models, or we have to repurpose some of the network uh, uh, protocols that we're using uh, to address this problem. Um, and uh, this is an initiative, a parallel initiative we have in Canada. We're working very closely with this group. And they've been working here with the people, for example, Manticore, uh, I2CAT, and HeNet, and so forth and with uh, Federica, uh, and, and using the same sort of technology. So all these technologies we're developing for Manticore and Federica are equally applicable to this type of solution of building virtualized networks, virtualized computation, clouds, and so forth. And it's all, all the same challenges of access, security, policy control, and so forth are needed for these types of networks as we do for traditional uh, virtualization services. So Prompt is about to announce an additional $12 million uh, for this program as well. Again, it's open to international partners. So we're talking a significant amount of money here, at least for Canada, uh, in this type of initiative. And we really want to uh, collaborate as much as possible. This is a global problem. This is not only a Canadian problem. And uh, we encourage as much as possible international participation. I know the EU is also looking at this. And uh, the EU Parliament has indicated a green IT is going to be a major issue for them, but I don't think they've allocated uh, uh, funds yet uh, for a program here in Europe. All sorts of possible research areas. I think if you're a graduate student, this is, to my mind, one of the more exciting areas to look at in terms of new routing architectures, new topology issues, uh, shortest path energy routing, we call it, uh, uh, resiliency architectures, how do you quickly move data around, data sets and uh, uh, routing engines and uh, BGP tables and so forth, depending on the availability of power. Uh, new stats and measurement analysis. Now we want to measure uh, bits per carbon instead of bits per second, all sorts of interesting areas of, of possible research. Um, and we have technology now for powering network nodes. You don't need those big uh, megawatt windmills you see out there, which a lot of people you know, don't like and there's a lot of protests. Again, these pictures should show uh, these what are called vertical axis turbines. 
which are much smaller, only about six feet in diameter, and totally enclosed. And uh, the one here at uh, Vertimax, on top of one of our colleges, uh, very inconspicuous, and they can produce up to 50 kilowatts of power in, under full wind. So you really, uh, when they say 50 kilowatts, it really gives you five kilowatts in practical purposes. But these devices are great. They can be located in cities and are ideal for uh, telecommunications and uh, Internet purposes. In fact, some of them are designed particularly for this type of market. Um, so if you want to see the pictures, come to me afterwards. Um, and again, if you look at Genie and Federica, I think that same type of architecture issues we're looking at in terms of next generation Internet of this virtualization, uh, just to replace the nodes powered by windmills and solar panels, and it's all the same sort of research challenges we face in the next generation Internet are implied to the next generation zero carbon Internet. And so I think this is a very great, uh, uh, you know, conclusion or a way of bringing these two initiatives together uh, in terms of research potential and so forth. Uh, so and now imagine taking Genie and we take away take away the topology, which is right now all network topology is based on the shortest path, and the, the nodes are where we have the largest common connections. But now if we have to relocate things, computers and facilities to remote areas, it really changes the topology and our routing capabilities and so forth. So there's some interesting challenges there uh, from a research perspective. Now, as I mentioned, we've already done some demos on the capability of moving large data sets and routing tables right around the world in less than a second. So we believe this is all possible. Uh, we did a demonstration with Nortel about two years ago where uh, uh, Nortel had a uh, research project called VM Turntable, Virtual Machine Turntable, where we can move an entire virtual machine uh, from one site in Calgary through uh, Chicago all the way over to Korea. We did this in less than a second. So it shows it's possible to move uh, complete routing tables and data sets around the globe very quickly, uh, depending on the availability of the, uh, the local power and so on and so forth. And we've done this because we had very high-speed networks like PaaS that are, of course, uh, not congested, as we have in our research networks, and uh, this was possible. And we think this is, if we could do this uh, on that type of network, it's possible to do it on the production network as well. Uh, now, just in a more broader approach, uh, the work we're doing with NRENs and so forth, also is very important to governments. As you know, governments are wrestling with the challenge of how to address the challenge of CO2, the talk about carbon taxes, of course, which is almost impossible to sell, particularly in this climate, uh, or this financial climate, I should say. And of course, the current focus is on cap and trade systems, as we, as we have here in Europe, uh, but we'll sit next time hopefully sell those emission permits rather than give them away. Um, and uh, this is what's being adopted by most of the rest of the world, particularly in the United States, Australia, and so forth. Another approach, which is now we're seeing by some governments, is uh, imposing carbon neutrality by law. Uh, they've done this in British Columbia, a province in Canada, and they're also talking about in several states in the United States. Rather than trying to impose all these different other policies, it's just telling everybody, you must be carbon neutral. Uh, it means no more taxes, or uh, you don't have to impose a tax. And it is the most best proven way of actually reducing CO2. So in British Columbia, in uh, uh, January of 2010, all public sector institutions must be carbon neutral. This is causing a major problem for the universities. As I mentioned, the universities, surprisingly, are one of the biggest emitters of CO2. And so they have to take, undertake major plans now to relocate their computing facilities, to change the way to do things on campuses to meet these targets. If they don't become carbon neutral, the universities must pay money into a carbon fund or uh, where the money's used for other purposes like planted trees and so forth. And I say all governments around the world are looking at this model because it's a much quicker way of uh, achieving uh, carbon reduction rather than depending on cap and trade and carbon taxes. And it will have a big implication on universities. But we believe there's another approach uh, and that's through carbon rewards, or something called G-commerce. And that's where we reward consumers and businesses to reduce their carbon footprint rather than penalizing them. We've seen the success of this type of business model with, you know, travel points and hotel points and so forth. So if you want to change consumer behavior, you reward them with a product or service rather than penalize them with a tax or extra cost. And this is where, again, networks and ICT can play an important role and where universities and NRENs can play a role as well, is to provide virtualized services over our networks as rewards to students 
and faculty in reducing their carbon footprint and other aspects of their life, from transportation, airplane travel, and so on and so forth. So it's providing all sorts of virtualized services like e-health, e-books, uh, uh, movies, and so forth, and music over our networks to students in exchange uh, for them reducing their carbon footprint. And it could be telephone services, cell phone services, it could be Wi-Fi on buses and so forth. And why we want to do this is a study done by the European Commission on Joint Research a couple of years ago that shows that virtualization of goods or dematerialization will have the biggest impact on reducing CO2 emissions around the world, about 15 to 20 percent. <laughs> In that analysis, they assume that ICT power consumption will go up about 5 percent to provide these virtualized goods, but if we build a zero carbon internet, we don't think we'll have that uh, bump up on the upper right. In fact, we can achieve about 20 percent. And so this is why this is important and why the Internet and research network can be so critical in helping not only address our own CO2 footprint, but providing solutions for students and faculty and the public at large in reducing their footprint by rewarding them with virtual goods and products. Another nice picture. This is a MIT Sixth Sense. If you haven't seen that, this is where they've developed a virtualized service, a little projector on your uh, eyeglasses, where rather than having a physical cell phone, they project an image of a keypad on your hand, and you can dial a number by just pressing the image on your hand, or you can watch a video on a blank piece of paper, and so on and so forth. But this is the type of research thinking we need in terms of virtualization and dematerialization. Other applications, of course, are using cloud, Google Docs, so on and so forth. And of course, our whole internet culture is uh, very good for this in terms of early adoption and so forth. So this is why this plays an important role. Why, again, we want to do this is that a study came out of the UK uh, uh, Association of British Industries. Uh, they analyzed this and they said that consumers are directly or indirectly responsible for 65% of all CO2 emissions. 35% uh, directly through transportation, heating, and so forth and 25% indirectly for the goods and products we purchase. So if we can get consumers to reduce their CO2 footprint by delivering virtualized services over networks, we can have a big impact uh, globally on reducing CO2. Some of good examples, right here in Malaga, I was pleased to see that uh, they're putting Wi-Fi in the buses. They haven't made it open to the public, unfortunately, uh, but at least uh, the service they're offering here to uh, uh, us is great. Uh, other examples are in Birmingham, uh, there's others in Arkansas and the United States. In San Francisco now, there's a commercial bus service set up uh, where they're offering uh, commuters uh, this office on the move. So rather than commuters sitting in the car, they can get on this bus, get free Wi-Fi, central cell service, and so forth. They get a tiny little desk, they can work with their office uh, and get things done rather than being stuck in traffic and so forth. And this is the type of thinking we need uh, to, uh, to help address problems, transportation, and so forth. Um, and so another project, there's several now under the way we started this in Ottawa, uh, is to provide free internet and free high-speed fiber to the home as part of the strategy as well. And uh, um, uh, Google's been really uh, been quite captivated by this, and they've written several papers and done a, a workshop on this. And this is where we bundle internet and high-speed internet, or high-speed fiber, uh, with your gas and electric bill and encourage customers to reduce energy consumption as they do so, uh, they still get their fiber and high-speed internet, uh, and, but also get to reduce their carbon footprint. And so customers not penalized again uh, if they reduce their carbon footprint, they reward it uh, through this new service. And more importantly, the network operator now gets a guaranteed revenue stream based on uh, the carbon footprint and energy consumption of the consumer rather than trying to make money on the, you know, uh, triple play and digital rights management and all that nonsense. So anyway, that's uh, just a brief overview of uh, uh, what we're doing. And again, I encourage uh, people who are interested to, if they want to work on a, uh, collaborate in our pilots to uh, contact me. Uh, there's more details here. Uh, I think this is going to be the biggest challenge we face uh, collectively in our community. And I think we're well positioned to be one of the, you know, really show to government and uh, our policy leaders that we do have the solutions that the university and the community really can be important leaders in addressing this problem, showing how networks to really play a critical role in addressing the biggest challenge facing this planet. Thank you. Okay, sure. Time for questions. We have time for a couple of questions. Anybody has any?
everybody just stunned with the idea of having to design for networks that will break when the sun sets. We spent 20 years trying to get our routers really solid and never have to reboot them. I don't know if you remember if people with gray beards remember rebooting your router every uh, several times a day. Now we want to do that purposely. <laughs> Um, I think I know what your answer to this question may be, but um, I just wanted to comment that while things like hydroelectricity are not going to impact on the, uh, the, the carbon footprint, they do in themselves cause other forms of environmental damage. So I don't think anybody should put themselves that some of these renewable, so-called renewable energy sources don't bring different problems. I just to make that yeah, yeah, a very valid point is that there's nothing truly zero carbon. Everything you do always has a carbon footprint. It's the degree of how much it contributes. So hydroelectricity, the, the reservoirs, uh, they uh, re release a lot of methane and CO2. There is a new hydroelectric technology which is far less harmful and it's called the run of the river turbines. And uh, these can be installed. You don't need a dam anymore. They don't affect product life and so forth. Uh, they're much smaller capacity but they're ideal for small rivers and streams and so forth, and they can produce a phenomenal amount of power without the environmental uh, impact. Uh, and it's ideal for data centers. I'm guessing that's yet another intermittent source. Uh, well, it does, it does, why you have dams is it, the, the reservoir gives you uh, water all year round. Run the river, of course, you're dependent on the flow in the river, which will vary with the season. Yeah, right. Good morning, uh, Lydia from Porto. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and challenging uh, presentation. And uh, um, I wonder if um, um, you challenge the NRENS for doing, for instance, the housing of uh, um, servers. For, for the university, if this is a challenge for the NRENs, because the NRENs, I think, are not um, available at this moment to do this kind of service. I know that some of them do, but this is not um, very uh, a service that they, they um, really care. So, are the resources of the university the avail available to use servers uh, in this um, uh, cloud, if right. you want, uh, how to um, push them to use the service like this? So there's two approaches to that. Uh, some NRENs do want to get into the business of hosting and, and building data centers uh, for the universities and so, so forth. Others are, don't want to get into that business market or don't feel comfortable with it, and they partner with industry uh, data center companies. Uh, and so in Canada, we've seen both in British Columbia, for example, uh, the university, the NREN is going to build a data center, and now with a new um, uh, shipping container data center, it's very much easier and cheaper to do it now, and they're going to build a data center right at a power plant, and they're going to use what's called turbine spin-up power. Uh, every utility uh, it produces excess power to what the electrical grid demands, and they take that excess power and they dump it in huge heat sinks. It's wasted. And, uh, and so the NREN, BCNet, says, well, we'll take that excess power you're just throwing in the heat sinks. We'll use it to drive our data centers for universities. And so it, so it can be free power, sound power, and uh, it's a great relationship they have done that And uh, because they have the high-speed optical network. So um, that's one model that's worked. They have to do this because I mentioned British Columbia universities have to be carbon neutral in six months. So they're in panic mode. Um, but other NRENs are looking to partner with industry. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Very challenging. Lydia Cresson is also, I think, a wonderful link into our next talk, uh, which is Paul Watson, Professor Paul Watson from the University of Newcastle, and he asked me to come on. Didn't know somewhere. Um, he asked me to introduce him as. Yeah. I think it's trying to di display the slides, the pictures after all. Okay. 
So, um, so Paul is Professor of Computer Science at the University of Newcastle. He works a lot with researchers encouraging them to use cloud computing for their research. He also asked me to say that he isn't a pure lifelong academic. He did used to work in industry when the UK had a computer industry for a company called ICL, which those of you who, like me, are now natural blonde again will remember. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Ah, here we are. Okay, so Bill's excellent talk talked about the, uh, the advantages to the environment of using cloud computing. What I want to do is to talk about the advantages to those who are deploying and managing applications for using cloud computing. And to start off with, I'm going to use a slide from a, a company that we do some work with, Arduino Technologies, and this shows some of the current problems with the ways in which applications are managed within organisations. So you can see at the top, nowadays you have to have very uh, dynamic um, demand for applications, so new applications are coming online all the time. There's often viral effects, so one user suddenly discovers an application, finds it useful and they tell other users, and so suddenly applications, the number of users dramatically increases. Uh, so we have to try and be able to cope with this very dynamically changing uh, requirements for our applications. But then at the bottom end, we often have very sort of static structures which we use to try and support this. So it's not unusual to have applications in silos. So every application has its own silo with its own hardware on which it runs. And you can see uh, two of the effects of this. So on the left, you've got an application which has suddenly become very popular and the hardware that was procured for it is now unable to cope with the, the demand the users see poor performance and start to complain uh, to the uh, IT providers about this. And then on the other side, on the right hand side, in, a, in another silo, you have an application which is actually uh, not really doing very much. So it's not using all the resources which have been purchased for it. And if management knew about that, they might think that the capital investment they made in that hardware wasn't really being well used. So we see these two different sorts of uh, uh, of uses under provisioning and over provisioning and it's largely because of the difficulty of capacity planning. When we think about deploying an application, we have to think about what resources we need to support that application and actually predicting the future is, uh, is very difficult and uh, it's hard to, hard to get right. The other problem with this approach is what happens if you want to introduce a new application. So we need to get some more capital to buy some more resources, some hardware resources on which to deploy that application. And of course, at the moment, with the, the credit crunch around the world, it's very difficult to get management to, uh, to hand over funding for, for new hardware. Um, and so this introduces a problem if the organisation is trying to be agile and wants to introduce new applications in order to stimulate business in a particular way, but doesn't want to spend money on hardware. So this is a problem that we often find in organisations at the moment, this sort of very static sort of structure. So here's a, another company which I want to talk about. So this is a company called Animoto, and I don't know how many of you have used Animoto. So Animoto is uh, a web-based company, and they produce slideshows. So you go to Animoto, and you upload a set of photographs, perhaps of your holiday, perhaps of the, the excellent reception last night in the, in the bullring, and you either select some music that they, they offer on their website, or you upload your own music, and you press go, and what, behind the scenes, what happens is that Animoto produce you a, a slideshow with the transitions between the slides matched to the music. And there's quite a lot of computation needs to go on, as you can imagine, in order to do that. They have to analyse the music to understand when the transitions are occurring, and they have to create the movie from, by stitching up together all of these, all of the, um, the photographs that you've uploaded to them. And you can see in the graph at the bottom, uh, what happened to Animoto last year. So you can see that this is users against time. You can see that there were, they had a small number of users and then suddenly it started to grow and then there was a huge peak uh, which occurred. And I, I don't know whether any of you can guess why that, why that was, but um, they, they were actually splash dotted as, as the saying goes. So the splash dot blog, which I guess many of you might follow, um, had a little article about Animoto 
with a link and so lots of, that attracted lots of users. Now the interesting thing about Flashdot is that many startup companies dream of being mentioned in Flashdot because it's a way to drive lots of users to them. It's very well read uh, among the technical, technical community. But ironically, the thing which they most hope for quite often kills them. So I don't know whether you, uh, you've ever gone to links on Flashdot, but often if you go to the link, then you get a, a fairly sparse web page which says, apologies, we are down at the moment. We will come back in a few days. And so the reason is that lots of people have gone to the website, the system can't cope with that, and uh, so the, the system goes down and they have to uh, rejig the system to cope with the demand. And of course, by then, you've lost those users. The users will never bother to come back again. They'll have forgotten about the, about the company. But as you can see, Animoto, so this is actually... Uh, this is actually the uses of the system. This is the, the graph of the movies that were made over time. You can see they managed to scale up quite, quite happily without any, any problems. So, thinking back to the previous slide, we might think, well, obviously what they did was they had somebody who was very good at capacity planning and he worked out that if they ever appeared in Flashdot, they would need so many servers in order to service the number of users that would drive to them. And then they bought a big data centre and then they bought lots of servers and they were all sitting there for, for months waiting and then suddenly the users arrived and the servers that were, that were running their, their applications could soak up the extra load as it arrived. But actually, Animoto don't have any servers at all, so this is one of the interesting things about them as a company. And all that they do is they use cloud computing, so every time there's a user uploads pictures to Animoto, photographs to Animoto, they store them on an external cloud, in this case the Amazon cloud, and then when they have to stitch together those pictures to make the slideshow, they grab CPUs from the Amazon cloud and they use that to, to, build, the, to build the movie. So, this is an example of a company which is successful. They haven't had to make a large capital outlay for IT kit. They can scale up, and as you can see at the end, when they, after the splash dot effect and the number of users dip, they could scale down again by relinquishing those CPUs, and they can do this without owning their own hardware. So, what I want to do in the rest of this talk is to uh, talk a bit more about what cloud computing is, how people like Animoto can use it, uh, talk something about why cloud computing, so when is cloud computing appropriate. I'll talk about a particular sort of cloud computing that we've been pursuing for scientists called eScience Central. And then because I don't want this talk to be purely evangelical, there are pros and cons to using clouds, which I want you to be uh, aware of. And so I'll end by talking about some of the issues which people need to think about if they're considering using cloud computing. So, I wanted to start with a definition, and uh, as I was looking through web pages to try and find a definition of cloud computing, I was reminded of that old uh, joke about IT standards, where the, the guy says, uh, I really like IT standards, there's so many of them to choose from. And the, the attraction of uh, trying to find uh, um, a definition of cloud computing is it's the same, you can find a definition for almost anything that's been described as cloud computing. But this is one that I quite like. So this is by uh, Irving Blasky Berger, who used to be very senior in IBM. And it talks about the idea of a broad range of services aimed at giving functional capabilities to users on a pay-as-you-go basis. Uh, and it talks about the fact that it allows people to do, allows organizations to do things that would otherwise require large amounts of hardware, software, and a lot of professional skills. Um, and many people sometimes look at definitions of cloud computing and think, well, you know, what's new about this? We've had mainframes, we've had computer bureaus for 30, 40, 50 years. And uh, there's three key things which are identified, which I think are important in a, in a report from Berkeley on cloud computing. So the first one is that you get this illusion of infinite computer resources on demand. So companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they're investing enormous amounts of money in building data centers. And a lot of the investment is for their own internal IT, so in Google's case, for example, so that they can, they can offer a search service. But now they're starting to make some of these machines available externally to users on a pay-as-you-go basis. And they can make 
tens, hundreds, thousands of machines available. So as far as most IT organisations are concerned, that's an infinite number of computing resources available to them on demand. Secondly, there's no upfront commitment by users. So, um, in the old days, you could rent CPUs and what you'd do is you'd go and have a look at some catalogues on the web and then you would call a salesperson in and you would negotiate and work out how long you're going to take out a certain number of CPUs for and what the cost would be for that. Um, and so the, there was this idea of a long-term relationship. This is no longer the, the case. So now you can go to a website, you can type in your credit card number and then you can immediately get access to all the CPU and storage resources that you need. So this is a very different way of thinking. It can be very agile in the way in which you grab and use these resources. And finally, because you pay as you go for resources, you're only paying for what you use. So it's a bit like mobile phone uh, pricing policy. So for each hour of CPU, in fact I've got a, a slide which gives some ideas of the, the costs on Amazon Web Services. So you can see there that um, they run Zen virtual machines. In the virtual machine you can run whatever soft operating system and software stack you want. And you pay for CPU, you pay about 10 cents an hour. For uh, blob storage, so just uh, binary data storage, you're paying 12 cents a gigabyte a month. And you are charged for transferring data uh, in and out. So you can see that these are uh, not uh, costs over a long period of time. You don't have to commit to, to months or years of using the CPU. You can just go and grab your resources, use them, and then relinquish them and pay for, pay for what, you, uh, what you use. Different companies are providing different levels of software and services through the cloud. And uh, in order to uh, try to give you an overview of this, I thought it was useful to use a, a taxonomy by Robert Anderson. And so he split clouds into three different levels. So at the bottom, we've got the infrastructure as a service cloud. So this is where you go and grab low-level resources like CPUs or uh, data storage. And the classic example of that is the Amazon services, which we've just seen on the previous slide. But also companies like uh, Microsoft with their Azure, .NET services, they're moving in into that area as well. But then above that, there's the platform level. So this tends to be two things. So one is higher level middleware. So in the case of Microsoft, for example, instead of, if you want to use Microsoft SharePoint, instead of having to deploy it on your own service and manage those services, they'll deploy it in the cloud and you just go and use it uh, as, you, as you want and then pay them uh, for the, the business model based on users and how long you use it for. Um, similarly, Amazon provides some higher level services such as uh, simple databases and queues and so on that you can just grab in the cloud and use. An interesting one is Google. So Google's cloud offering at the moment is uh, another sort of platform. So this is where there's an environment provided which is actually quite restrictive but you get some benefits from using it. So all that the Google App Engine does is to allow you to run a web server. So basically you give the Google App Engine the code that you want to run when a request comes in to your web server. It can be in Python or Java at the moment and Google runs it and returns the result to you. The reason why uh, that's very restrictive but you get some benefits is because they'll automatically scale out. So they monitor the number of requests coming to your code and if the requests are such that the response to users is starting to slow down, then what they will do, they will automatically replicate your code on multiple CPUs so as to keep a reasonable response time to users. So that's why I put the, the arrow at the right hand side which shows that as you go downward you get more complexity because you basically you can do whatever you want at the low level. You can grab CPUs, run whatever software you want on them, and that gives you lots of flexibility. But as you go up to the platform level, you get more restrictions, but you reduce the complexity. So at that level, you can have these services which will automatically scale for you for particular sorts of applications. And then finally, there's the software as a service level, which I think we're all familiar with now, things like Google, Google Docs. Um, Salesforce.com, that's an interesting one. So they do customer relationship management entirely through the, through the web. And I think that's interesting because they've, got a, they've been very successful in doing that, even though when they first launched, a lot of people thought that no companies would really upload over the web to an external company information on their customers and their salespeople 
and their products and, and, and so on. So, so that's an example of a, of a, a niche uh, market being provided over the web, perhaps in an area that people thought uh, many companies would never touch. So, um, to give you some idea of our own experiences and give you some examples, I'm going to talk about one particular science project that we've, uh, for which we're using a cloud. So this is the Carmen project in the UK. It's funded by the UK EPSRC, with the, uh, one of the research councils there, and it has investigators all around the UK. And the IT uh, infrastructure is being designed and built by ourselves at Newcastle and colleagues at York. And the reason for this project is that a group of us have got together because we, we think that the greatest challenge left in science is to try and understand how the brain works. And uh, that's not just for biologists, although obviously biologists would love to understand more about how the brain develops and how it, how it works, but also in medical science because lots of drugs operate on the brain. And for me, I, so I'm a computer, science, uh, computer scientist by background, then it's clear that computers are much better uh, at some things than brains are, but there are whole swathes of things that brains are good at, like image recognition. So looking around, I can pick out people who I talked to uh, last night and think about the conversation that we had in the in the bullring. Something that our software, our computers can't touch at, at the moment. They've been able to do that sort of uh, image recognition and pulling back data that was associated with that. So, so we think that if we can understand more about how the brain works, it could be. Uh, it could be breakthroughs in many different areas. And I'll give you one example. So this is an uh, example of uh, epilepsy. So this is some work being done in the, in the project. So once a month at the main hospital in Newcastle, they do an operation on patients who suffer severely from epilepsy. And uh, these are patients where they've tried drugs, but unfortunately drugs can't control the, the seizures which they, which they suffer from. And so the only solution is to remove the part of the brain which the, the field is causing the, the problem. And what the, the surgeon would like to do is, as they, as they do the operation, they use electrodes uh, to stream out information. They'd like to process this in near real time so that they could get some understanding of the patterns of activity uh, which, which may indicate that the part of the brain which they're, they're now uh, exploring is responsible for the epileptic seizures. Uh, and also they want to store this data so that they can then analyse it and share it with others to try and look for patterns and understanding, perhaps compare the data collected from different patients. And um, so this is a, a warning, so that I'm going to show two slides with an exposed human brain, so if you don't uh, enjoy this sort of thing, then look away now. After yesterday, then I felt that probably I should have done this in 3D and given you some glasses out to make it more, uh, more realistic, but this is just in 2D, I'm, I'm afraid. Okay, so here we go. So, um, so this is before the operation. So the surgeon has identified the rough area of the brain that he thinks the, the problem is in and he's then exposed it. And then you can see the electrodes, the two sets of four electrodes which are placed over the brain and the surgeon will move these around until he sees the sorts of patterns that indicate that this is a problem. And he will then remove that part of the brain. And you'll be pleased to know that I don't have a, any photographs of that part of the, uh, the operation. Okay, so that's it now. So anybody who is uh, looking away is safe to, uh, to look back at again. So when we talk to the, um, talk to the, the users, then, uh, the, the neuroscientists, then it's clear what they have to do is they have to try and store very large quantities of data. They have to be able to analyse uh, this data, and it's often computationally intensive. So if you've got tens or hundreds of terabytes of data and you want to run your analysis routines over to look for patterns, this can take a very, a very long time. They also want to be able to automate this. So they want to be able to um, have an expert who works out a process for analysing data. And the, the click of a button, they just want to be able to run that process on all of the new data that arrives after every experiment. And then they want to share the data, but under fine-grained user control. So sometimes people think that what scientists are happy to do is to collect data and make it available to anybody, because that's, that's good for science, so anybody can, uh, can make advances by understanding the data. But in fact, the reward system in science is that you get your rewards by publishing papers on the analysis. So in general, scientists aren't prepared to release their data until they've actually got the, the papers uh, 
published in science or nature or, or wherever. So what they want to do is typically, initially when they upload the data, only they are allowed to see it. Then beyond that, they might, uh, once they've done some sanity checks to make sure that it seems reasonable, they'll let their PhD students and they'll let their, their collaborators in their lab have a look at it. And then they might share it with other people who they, they work with around the world. And finally, when they produce the journal articles, then they may allow it to be uh, completely open for other scientists to analyse. So you need a, a fine-grained security system which, uh, which allows you to do this. And it, in fact, when we're looking at those, if I go back to this slide again, you'll see store, analyse, automate, share. Then uh, we've been running this Northeast Regional Science Centre for seven or eight years and we've had, uh, well, so 25, I think it's now 26 projects across many different uh, domains. You can see some of them there ranging from uh, neuroscience through to artistic performance analysis. So there's a huge range of different researchers we've worked with. But you keep coming back to the same needs. Store, analyse, automate and share. And so we decided to try and build a system, which we call eScience Central, which would uh, be a general eScience tool for, for users. And the little uh, badge that's come up is because a lot of the support has come from our regional development authority, One North East. And in designing this, we decided we wanted to push a few technologies that we thought were promising. So we're researchers that so were interested in taking new technologies and ideas and seeing what we can do with them. And the three that we focused on for this project were, if I start at the top, so software as a service. So one of the problems with a lot of e time software is you have to find the software, you have to deploy it, you have to configure it, uh, and this is beyond most users. So we decided we wanted a browser-only system. So you just go to a website and you can do your science on the website. Then social networking, so I've talked about the fine-grained security control that's needed and we, we've noticed the way in which a lot of the younger scientists uh, um, work with work friends through things like Facebook. So, and that gives you quite fine-grained access, so you can make connections to friends, you can form communities through groups, and then you can share information uh, to, to your friends or, your, or, or groups with, with which you are associated. So we decided to try and use that as a basis for the security system and the way in which to build scientific communities in the software. And then, and the reason for this talk is at the back end we're interested in a cloud platform for science. So that we could dynamically grab resources as needed as the number of users rose and as the complexity of the computations that they did rose, rose too. So we ended up with this sort of science cloud architecture here. So you can see the users in front of their browsers on the left so they can just go to a, a web browser and access the, the, the cloud. They can upload data and services and they can run analyses and share the data in the cloud. And this is the architecture that we came up with to support um, the users. So you can see it's got the classic uh, three-level architecture that I talked about, the Robert Anderson taxonomy. So at the bottom, we've got the basic processing and storage. This is where the data and the metadata goes. This is where the analysis routines are actually executed. And then we've got this science cloud platform. So trying to allow people to write analysis routines, but to write them within a, an environment which is at a higher level, so they don't have to worry about the cloud, they don't have to worry about security. That's all taken care um, for them by the, the underlying system. So basically users can write analysis routines, upload them into the cloud, and they run, they can be run in workflows which combine them together, and then as they're executed, the system itself will go and grab resources from the cloud and schedule them on it, make sure that the data is there, run the analysis, and then just return the results to the, to the user. And then the, on the right, you've got the social networking software, and above that, the security, which makes sure that uh, the users are only allowed to see the, the data and the, and the analysis routines that others have allowed them to have access to. So, so this is, uh, this is the architect. I'll just give you a few screenshots to show you the sorts of things that we can do with it. So this is the, uh, software, so I said we've pushed the software as a service idea. So this is a screenshot of being able to create, edit, and run workflows entirely in a, in a browser. Not, doesn't need a desktop application. So on the left you get collections of services. You can just drag them onto the palette and connect them up with lines. And when you're ready, then you can just press 
uh, run. So you can see the little run button at the, at the top there. When you click run, then behind the scenes this is scheduled onto a, onto a cloud and you get the results back. So here's the results again through a browser window so you can have a look at these and you can see actually there's three results from this run which I did last December. So um, one is the top one is the workflow itself so others could go back and have a look at the workflow and rerun it if they wanted to or use it on their own data. Below that is the result of this analysis which is actually a trend graph uh, as a JPEG and below that there's a report on the run so that tells you how the run went whether there any failures or not. So if I click on the trend graph then I would get this coming up again in the browser so scientists can view the, the results. Once they've got the results because everything's in the cloud, everything's uh, shareable, then they can write blogs which are a bit like science, cross between blogs and scientific notebooks so they can write about the experiments, what they did, and then you can see the, uh, the, what we think is the interesting feature which is in the right there pointed out, you can put links to results and workflows. So this means that others, other scientists, if they have permission, they'll see those links and they can go and have a look at the results, they can have a look at the input data uh, which was used in the workflow and they can see the workflow itself. This means that scientists can get to the data and perhaps try their own analysis techniques on it to see whether they be get better or worse results. They can get to the workflow and they can run that workflow to like the workflow on their own data. So the idea is to try and share best practice by allowing people to share uh, both the data and the, the, the computations. And uh, one thing that, uh, again, because everything's in the cloud, you've got your data there and you're doing your analysis there, then you can build up a provenance trail. And this is a, I picked a particular piece of data that I uploaded uh, some time ago, so this was uh, uploaded, and then you can see the different sorts of runs that have been done on it, so the workflow runs which have been used to analyse our data. So it means if you come across some data in the system, you can see how it was created, perhaps directly uploaded by a particular user from an experiment, or perhaps the result of a particular workflow, you could go back and have a look at that workflow. Similarly, in the other direction, if you find some data, you can actually go and see all of the different analyses which have already been done on it. So this reduces the, the likelihood that people are repeating themselves and reanalyzing data. So you, you've, got, you've got ways to both look backwards and see how some data was created and forward to see what was done to it. Um, we, we ran that originally on our own service and in fact in the main we, we still do a lot of work on our own service but we started to do some work with uh, Microsoft. So Microsoft has this Azure Cloud which I mentioned uh, earlier and uh, we work with some people at Microsoft Reading and also the, the Microsoft uh, eScience group in Seattle. And this is a demo showing you what happens when we run it, this on a cloud. So this cloud, we've only grabbed one node at the moment. On the left you can see the jobs that have been created by a workflow, so they're sitting there. On the right, the results of those uh, jobs being returned. And with one CPU, it takes about 20 seconds, okay, there we are, to get each result. Now we go in and we grab another few nodes, so we've grabbed another nine nodes making ten in all from the Azure Cloud, and we'll go back now to see the, uh, to see what's happening, so you can see these, those requests still queued there. With the other nine nodes, those nodes are now starting to run the analyses, and we start to get results coming through more quickly, so uh, in a small while, we'll get another few batch of results. Okay, so there you can see now we've started to get through these these uh, analyses uh, ten times more quickly than we did before. So the, the, the reason for showing this is one is sort of a, a reality check that clouds are out there and you can use them to do, to do real work. But the other one is just to think about from my own experience before these clouds were available what, would, what would, I would have had to have done if I had a system, I had one server that it was running on and I found that because the number of users had been increased it was going far too slowly, users were starting to complain, I wanted to accelerate it. Well, what I, was, what I would have had to have done would have been to put in a request to the research councils in the UK for funding to buy a cluster with more nodes in it. That would have taken about six months to go through the reviewing process. After six months, they probably have said no, but if I was lucky, they might have said yes. And then in another three months, I would get the money. Then I would go and talk to our IT people who would tell me that there was no room in the server room for any other, uh, for my cluster and that there wasn't enough power and, and the air conditioning was about to pack in so it would be a while before I could actually install these, the systems in there. And so even 
in the best case, it might take a year from actually trying to get some extra nodes to them arriving and being useful. And yet, because of these clouds, we could have we could just go in and we could increase the number of uh, CPUs that we were using just just like that. And I put in 10 there, but I could have, if it was appropriate, I put in 100, grabbed 100 nodes or even 1,000 if that was needed for the work I was doing. So it's this ability to reduce the time from having the idea to being able to realise it, which is, I think, the attractive thing about cloud. Okay, just before I, I finish, I want to say something about when clouds may not be appropriate. I think that everybody considering clouds, like anything else in IT, needs to consider the pros and the cons. They aren't appropriate in all cases. So here's some things to think about. So large data transfers, so, uh, and Bill talked something about this, about the need for a better network which allows you to get to and from your, um, to and from your cloud. But I think given that most people here are network experts, then I don't need to, to say it can take an awfully long time to transfer uh, a large amount of data, terabytes of data over the internet at the moment. And sometimes you see people who would like to do things like online real-time analysis of streaming video in the cloud and really you have to make sure that you've got the bandwidth and also that you can afford the transfer cost because as I showed earlier, cloud companies do charge you to transfer data in and out of their, their cloud as well as for using their CPUs and their, and their disks. Um, the next one then, traditional high performance computing. So uh, the reason why companies like Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon can afford to buy tens, hundreds of thousands of servers and put them in their, these big data centers they're building up is because they buy commodity hardware and they buy commodity networking. And so what you need in order to exploit it is, is you need some scalability which can, which can work if you take what you're trying to do and you divide it up across a set of commodity machines which are loosely coupled. If you have single threaded work which requires a, a query or a query equivalent, if you have something which paralyzes but you need very low latency networking between the different nodes as you do for some sort of numerical analysis, it's not going to work well on one of these clouds. Um, confidentiality, so this is a, uh, a big issue, so if you've got um, medical data, if you've got data that's company sensitive, then you have to think not only are you sending it over the internet, but also at the other end you're putting it into uh, another company's resources, shared resources, and also it's quite likely at the moment that that cloud that you're uploading your data to is under another jurisdiction. So as Europeans, of course, most of these clouds are in the US at the moment, and we need to think carefully about the implications of that for data protection, security, and some of the legislative differences between different countries. Um, and the final one is high availability. So clouds at the moment do sometimes go go down. This is an issue, and uh, you know, Bill was talking about uh, the need to think about this from the point of view of renewable energy resources. So for when the sun goes down or when the wind drops, this needs to move uh, um, data around. But even at the moment, um, for ordinary data centers offered by these companies, there have been outages of up to two or three hours uh, so far. And so if you've really got something that's mission critical, then at the moment you, you should not run it on a single cloud, in my opinion. Um, the bottom two are quite interesting because uh, there's, people are trying to get around this now by thinking about ways to uh, not just deal with one cloud, but to federate clouds. And something that's quite popular for high availability or confidential data is to think about private clouds. So this is companies who think, well, if we look at Amazon or Microsoft and what you can do with the cloud there, it's great the way you can just grab nodes when you need them, release them when you need them. If only our internal IT was like this. And so companies are starting to think about can they reconfigure their internal IT so that they can use it in this dynamic way and it has this advantage that there's a potential there for both high availability and also for dealing with confidential data that you don't want to go out of your organisation. And uh, so, so again looking at some, some work by uh, Arjuna Technologies, a, a company from the northeast of England who we collaborate with. So they've got this, these mechanisms for using service agreements to combine silos together within IT organisations to build these dynamic private clouds. And once you've done that, then you might also build a service agreement to a public cloud. So it may be that you use your private clouds until they're actually full, until they're completely utilised, and then in those circumstances you're prepared to ship work out externally to an external public cloud. 
And then if you're worried about availability for those sorts of, uh, for that sort of work which is going out to these clouds, then you may even think about building service agreements to multiple uh, external public clouds and having some way of policy driven mechanism for deciding based on perhaps cost or availability where to send your work. So my feeling is that in the future, Cloud federation will become important, and it was interesting to see that in Bill's talk as well, the, the idea of federating clouds because of the, the, uh, the need to, of dealing with renewable energy. But already um, we've seen commercial organisations thinking about these sorts of federated cloud systems. Okay, so just to, to end, so personally I think that cloud computing creates some exciting new opportunities. The one that's often highlighted is this way in which uh, if you need compute resources rather than needing hardware to buy it and manage it yourself, then to, rather than needing the capital to do that, then you can actually avoid the capital spend and translate that to operational expenditure instead, which is seen as attractive at the moment by many companies where capital is, is really in short supply. I think it's very attractive for handling dynamic changes in demand and more and more as we make applications available over the web and we see these viral effects then it's becoming more important to have ways to, to deal with sudden increases in the number of users and the complexity of the work that they are doing. So, as I've said, it's not appropriate in all cases, so it's very important that people weigh up the pros and cons before they commit to using a cloud computing. And I think that federation, cloud federation, is something for the future which is going to start to address some of the current concerns over clouds. Looking specifically at uh, e-science, I think cloud can really revolutionise these science because you can get scientists who going into work on the morning have an idea and then they can realise it very quickly just by grabbing the computational resources that they need in order to pursue that. And as I said, we're exploring this with our system, uh, eScience Central, and I can give a demo if anybody can get a web browser up, I can give a demo uh, to them. I'm happy to do that. I'm here for the rest of the conference. Um, and one slight caveat, which is that we shouldn't underestimate complexity. So, uh, we're building scalable distributed systems here and everybody knows that that is hard and clouds aren't a magic way to reduce the difficulty of building these sorts of systems. So, it's important to, uh, uh, that we understand the complexity of the systems that we're trying to build, be it to make them scalable, highly available, highly manageable. It's not an easy thing, thing to do and clouds don't uh, make it any more easy. Uh, and finally, perhaps the way to think about addressing that in particular domains is to think about higher level environments. So the way the Google App Engine uh, makes it easier for people to build scalable web services, in which Microsoft Azure makes it easier to, uh, for example, build scalable um, uh, SharePoint deployments or scalable .NET uh, applications. And in the case of eScience Central, in which we've tried to make it easier for scientists developing analysis tools to make it easier to take advantage of the cloud. I think that whenever we go into a domain, it's good to think about what high-level environment we can provide so that our developers, and certainly our users, aren't actually aware that there's a cloud underlying their, their system, and that should be the aim, that the, the cloud shouldn't leak up through the, to the application stack. Thank you. Paul, any questions? Mm -hmm. ah, Victor. Thanks very much, Paul. Interesting talk. I'm, I'm Victor Wright from HGANET. Um, I have a question. I, I'm working for a uh, national research and education network. If I look at the clouds, you have the private clouds, which are, let's say, in our client uh, environment. You have the commercial clouds, which are uh, public ones, which are outside the annual environment. What do you think is the function, or could be the function, of a uh, national research and education network? Uh, should we build our own cloud user clouds, or should we be brokered towards uh, the commercial clouds? Or do you have an idea about that? Is there a business case for national research networks to do this? So, um Personally, I think it's good for people to understand as a starting point what's available commercially because it's very hard for organisations to compete with the economies of scale 
that people like Microsoft and Google and Amazon have. And as capital becomes uh, uh, tighter, as I've said, harder to get hold of, then this really is, is a way to avoid the need to, for capital spend in order to do interesting, innovative things. But of course, as soon as we do that as researchers, we'll find limitations and we'll decide as researchers we think that we can do better and, uh, and then we want to explore that in the hope that in five, ten years some of the things that we've, we've developed will then appear in these commercial, in these commercial crowds. And so I, I, would, I would take a two-pronged strategy. And for example, I think that um, if you're looking for particular topics, I think the issue of uh, confidential data, medical research data, is something that's not really uh, addressed at the moment and most people would avoid clouds for that. Is there a way in which we can use commercial clouds or do we have to always use internal clouds for that? And I think the other interesting issue is to do with policy. So given that you've probably got a set of users doing a set of different things, some of which are commercial, some of which aren't, how dynamically can the, can the middleware make decisions? Okay, it's okay to send this off to Amazon, it's, we can send this off to Microsoft, but this we need to run internally in our own system. I think that's a very interesting area. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. My, my name is Sergi Ciro. I am from the Educat Foundation. I just think that now you are talking about federation, then of complex services, that maybe it means that you want to create a complex service with services that are all around distributed. You have talked about on-demand sources. However, what I am missing in some way, I wonder if when we are talking about infrastructure, you only talk about storage and process, and you don't talk about networks. Mm -hmm. And you think that would be interesting to us here also that network infrastructure, in order to be sure that we are mapping the SLA from the application of the service down to the infrastructure network? Yeah, so I, I think, again, that's a, that's, a very, uh, that's a very good point. In fact, it reflects the fact that whereas almost everybody here is a network, an expert on networking, I'm not an expert on networking. But it's clear that... Um, um, what people want from applications is, is some end-to-end -end characteristics and they don't really care about how you divide the application up internally. They want their users to get a response within a particular length of time. They want to get a particular throughput for their application. And in order to do that requires uh, being able to build distributed systems which meet requirements and meet uh, potentially SLAs. And if you look at the SLAs offered by cloud vendors at the moment, they're very weak and uh, perhaps for reasons we can all, we can all guess, it's not easy to, to be able to, uh, uh, to offer a particular level of demand and guarantee it with, uh, with money behind it. So I think that um, understanding how to use cloud in distributed systems that meet particular service level requirements is a, is a really interesting research topic and I think it's perhaps one that's, uh, that's not been pursued very much so far. Thank you. I wonder from what you say uh, whether research councils, whether uh, you have uh, any feeling that research councils are recognizing the potential of cloud computing and moving, uh, looking more critically at, um, looking more critically at applications uh, and capital expenditure to, um, if you like, recurrent expenditure on cloud computing. Yeah, so, um, so I think that's an, an interesting point. One of the things that I've observed in both companies who have uh, had some dealings with and also uh, amongst university researchers is often the people who are using clouds are people who are just uh, decided they were at home one night and they thought, oh, I know, I'll start to use a cloud to do this particular application. So rather than go through their organisation and try to secure resources in that way, perhaps from research council, perhaps from their own university uh, resources, they go directly to the to the cloud providers and they start to use it. So uh, when I worked in the industry, this would have been called skunk works, and I guess it's the same thing, thing today, individuals. And uh, if it's like most skunk works, what will happen is people will develop things, they'll show it to others in their organisation, other people will start to use it, and eventually it will be blessed by the, the organisation. But um, my, my colleagues in e-business call this uh, disintermediation. So they say that it's a bit like what happened to travel agents, uh, high street insurance brokers, that uh, whereas in the past the consumer had to go to an intermediary in order to get access to the resources, what the web has done is open up direct access and so travel agents now struggle because we can just go and book flights directly online. Um, and the same with, with uh, researchers who've got this burning idea that they want to pursue and rather than wait and try to get access to resources which they may have to uh, 
that the mere requirement put in proposal, they're prepared to get their credit card out and spend 40, 50 dollars in actually being able to do something that night in order to get the results for the paper that they need to submit by the end of the week. So it may well be that this sort of bottom-up entrepreneurial activity is something which drives this, drives this forward rather than the, the organisations who currently provide these sorts of facilities. on time. Particular thanks to both speakers for keeping exactly the time. Always makes sharing very easy. Thank you very much for your attention. There should be coffee in the main um, hall area and then the parallel session start again at 12 in the far courtyard. Thank you. Thank you.